I am now recording. We okay. are now recording. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. All right. Welcome, SIA members. Uh, my name is Emily Chorba, and I'm beginning my third year as president of the association. We've got other members of, um, of the board are on the call, and we've got Rebecca Downing, who's our treasurer. Um, Dave Summerton is our trails. Hi, Dave. Uh, let's see. I don't think that our secretary is there. Kelly, are you there? No. Kelly, okay. Here comes Brent. And Okay. You can introduce Brent. He's, he's logging in right now. So Brent will be on the phone. We never get to see him. He's, he always dials in. And he is um, our, our chairman of the beautification. And then Hannah. Is Hannah on the call? Not yet. Okay. Hannah is going to be new to the board. So um, we're looking forward to her joining. And I also will say this now and I'll say it at the end. We're looking for two more board members. So if you're so inclined to get involved and help us, please reach out to me um, or to our email, info at cliffimprovement.org. So for those of you who are new to the association, usually our first quarter membership meeting is held at the Mediterranean Sports Bar in Seacliff, which is across from Mary Ann's and next to Manuel's. But um, I think this is going to be the last time we have to do this meeting via Zoom. It's I think we've done two Zooms now, maybe three. Three. No, three we've done now. three. Yeah. God, I missed the med. Okay. So, but then throughout the year, we, we do a quarterly meeting. And the second quarter meeting is an ice cream social that we hold at Seacliff Village Park. And that's typically a Saturday in June. And then the third quarter, last year, we did a pizza party at the Coastlands Courtyard. And that was such a wonderful venue. Uh, we could probably put more people in there next time. We limited it, but the courtyard is open air and it's in September. So we'll probably do that again. And then the fourth quarter, we had a nice dinner gathering at, at Canteen. And we talked about the state of the association. And, and that was really great too. That was well attended, but again, we kept the numbers down. So, um, so be looking in the newsletters for in our future newsletters for these events. And in fact, our winter newsletter was just published uh, maybe 10 days to 14 days ago. So you're on this because you got it. <laughs> you're on the meeting. So I hope you had a chance to read all the great articles. Uh, most people are most people are muted, but we're getting some background noise from someone. So you can you mute can... everybody. You all have right. the power. All right. I have to find it again, of course. So there we go. Okay. Just if you're not going to be um, talking, then you can. Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing people. Great. That that'll be good. So um, for so tonight, um, our speakers have a few things to share. So if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. And if you want to speak to your question, you can also use the raise the hand feature, and we'll ask you to unmute yourself and go and you can go ahead. So our agenda is we've got Zach Friend, our Santa Cruz County Second District Supervisor. That's a mouthful for me. Um, he's going to talk first. Then we have Matt Machado, who's Santa Cruz County Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. Another mouthful. Then uh, we're going to vote to approve the Seacliff Mini Park project. And then I'll just discuss some upcoming associate, association activities, and then we'll close. So it, I think it's gonna be under an hour. So I hope you can all stay and in particular for the vote. We really need, want to see, want you to vote. So again, our first speaker is Zach. And um, I also wanted to, uh, Zach also contributes to our newsletter, our quarterly newsletter and is great at forwarding us information that might be relevant to the SIA members, which we then forward on to you. And I just got an email on the Santa Cruz sustainability update. So I don't know what, um, if you were gonna talk about that, Zach, but um, I am gonna turn it over to you and maybe you can introduce your two um, analysts, I think you call them. Okay, thanks, Zach. Thanks, Here's Emily. Zach. Yeah. yeah, it's good to see everybody. <laughs> and um, I, as you can see, I'm super dressed up. I just came from baseball practice here in Aptos. So I got my Aptos Little League. 
uh, <laughs> thing with Elliot over here having his no, dinner. Well, I, think, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so I, I was, let me first introduce the two, our, your entire team for the second district, which includes myself. Uh, mm -hmm. You've met Kieran, uh, as you may remember, when we had pizza outside Everyone. of Coastal. There's Karen and, and Allison, who's been uh, with us since day one, um, who handles all kinds of issues on behalf of, of the district, hey, Allison. And so this is your this is your second district team, and, and uh, they are significantly more qualified and brighter than I'll ever be. They are all rock stars. But if you ever need any of us, um, as you may remember, I've said this to you time and time again, because we have almost 60,000 people and almost 200 square miles that we manage there this is a very flat office every single person has full authority so anything you need you can write me you can write them uh, and we will do anything we can to get get stuff handled for you um, i was asked to uh, speak about the two ballot measures that the county has actually put forward directly uh, that'll be on your june ballot i wrote about it in the newsletter and uh, i'm sure every single one of you read every single word and were just gripped by uh, how riveting it was but let me walk you through the two things and why we're doing it. Um, the first one is a deals with a cup fee that the board had actually enacted quite some time back and then suspended uh, due to COVID. And this is a disposable cup fee or a paper cup fee. And one thing that I think that many people don't actually realize is that uh, the money on these fees, such as like the plastic bag fee that you pay or a paper bag fee that you pay at a grocery store, doesn't come back to the city or county that you pay it in. It just goes back to the business. Now, the main goal is obviously to have some, uh, you know, to provide an incentive for people to use reusable items. I mean, that's the real purpose. But a couple of years ago, when the board was contemplating this uh, this disposable cup fee, this 25 cent fee, which other jurisdictions throughout the state have already enacted. Uh, I, I made a point of saying that it, it seemed to me that since people already think that the money is coming back to the county or the city of which they're spending the money, then that money should actually come back to us. And I, I'm going to not get into too much details. This was quite a debate with among the board members, and we ended up uh, spending quite a time uh, debating as to whether the, the money should come back to the county or not. We ended up landing on this 50-50 split where half the money comes back to the business because there are costs to implementation of such a program, in particular on small businesses. But to be fair, they're still making money and actually a significant amount of money as a result uh, of the 25 cent fee and a less amount on the 12 and a half cent fee. But what I thought that the money should be used for, for environmental programs, things that are directly associated with the waste that's, that comes from Starbucks cups, for example, that we all see in the middle of the street, um, a lot of cleanups along the beach and such. And I worked with Matt uh, Machado, who is, uh, was our public works director and is now, he, as he will talk to you about tonight, the director of a combined uh, integrated department between planning and public works. And we recognize that, that we could bring in probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about three quarters of a million dollars or even more a year toward programs that we've never had funding specifically for, and including things like some of the work that Save Our Shores has done and, and other coastal cleanups that we've done, uh, even picking up needle waste or any sort of environmental type cleanup waste that we need to do. So the fee is the fee, meaning that irrespective of whether or not this, this measure passes by the voters, the 25 cent fee will still be there. The question that's being asked isn't whether or not you're going to raise the fee. The question is being asked, should half of that money come back to the county uh, for these types of programs? And I imagine that the other jurisdictions that currently have these fees, like the city of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, will also be looking to probably do the same thing once they see whether or not we're successful. But it creates a very stable stream of funding for these environmental cleanup programs uh, that doesn't currently exist. And so that's the, that is measure C for CUP. I don't know where they come up with the measures. They're just totally assigned, but I just, uh, I thought that you would remember it if I said that. So that's the first one. The second item is, is to raise the transient occupancy tax, which we haven't done in quite some time, which is the fees that are paid by tourists that come in, you know, the additional tax that are paid at hotels, uh, and vacation rentals and other services similar to that. Um, for some reason, the Sugar Hill Gang came into mind. I was about to say hotels, motels, and holiday inns. But then the third thing is, is obviously these vacation rentals. 
And as many of you know, because we've had a lot of community meetings about it, um, some vacation rentals are absolutely perfect and some are neighborhood nightmares. Um, one thing that is uh, not debatable though, is that uh, they do not, vacation rentals don't have to pay the kinds of fees that hotels pay when they're originally built, deficiency fees or in lieu fees, you know, things that deal with traffic mitigation or help offset the additional issues that they may create. And so as a result, you know, there's these commercial enterprises that are in residentially zoned districts and functionally they're not really paying for the same types. They're not helping you out from a service standpoint in any particular way. So we are looking to raise our transient occupancy tax on hotels to match the rate of our neighboring some of our neighboring jurisdictions, but to increase the transient occupancy tax on vacation rentals to actually be greater than that of local hotels in large part because they don't pay those initial deficiency fees. This could actually raise a lot of money should this pass uh, for the county. By the way, for both of these at this point, there doesn't appear to be any any actual formed opposition or organized opposition or anybody signing a ballot statement against it. We worked with uh, the local hotel industry as well as vacation rental advocacy organizations uh, to try and come up with, with something that everybody could support. Now, are they gonna formally come out and endorse it? That I don't know, but at the end of the day, it seems like we were able to reach a compromise that, that everybody understood. But this is estimated to bring in, once it's fully functional, about two additional million dollars a year for the general fund. As you know, the general fund funds everything from the sheriff's office to parks to some of our other services. And uh, given the explosion in the number of vacation rentals that we've had in our area, in Seacliff in particular, in the last decade, I think it'd be reasonable uh, to see some of those fees, which are paid disproportionately by people from, these are not paid by Santa Cruz County residents. These are people coming in, enjoying our area and then leaving. Uh, it'd be nice to have that, that money raised. So those are the two measures that, that I wanted to, to just ask you about. Um, if you have any uh, particular questions, I'd be happy um, uh, to answer that as well. Rebecca, I can't tell if people have their hand I, raised. I have a question. Yeah, What's that know. measure? T for tax? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Matt, do you actually know the the letter that was assigned? For, I can look it up very quickly. But does anybody oh, know no, the? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll Jeff, get... Jeff has a Jeff has a question. Why don't you go ahead, Jeff? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Zach. Uh, on a slightly different topic, but I'm asking it because of recently came in to, uh, to, no, to notice AB 841. Um, do you have a position on that? And could you say a little bit about the, 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 uh, that item and what it means for Santa Cruz County? And you mean 4, 481, Jeff? Uh, yes. The, uh, I think you said, you said 841, but I just want to confirm that. I'm, that I'm you, sorry, 481. Yeah. My, no, that's fine. Um, so this, for those that aren't familiar, this is basic, this is a new state law that functionally requires um, sheriff's office, well, law enforcement agencies to disclose any sort of equipment. Um, and Jeff, if I, if I don't have this totally down, just let me know, but it, the, any equipment that, that is uh, militaristic in nature, in essence, or that they've obtained through any of those exchanges. Uh, it's, it's, it's relatively broad, but there are exemptions for some specific weapons, like, for example, assault rifles are, are deemed a standard law enforcement firearm. And so that, even though that is a militaristic weapon, it's not something where it would necessarily have to be reported on. My understanding is if I, if I recollect, um, because I have relatively regular conversations with the sheriff, I think that at our next meeting, he's actually bringing forward an item to, on the initial reporting of this. And look, I mean, as somebody who worked for a law enforcement agency, um, for quite some time. I mean, in most cases, the, there's no, ne nothing necessitates uh, uh, direct exchanges with some of the militaristic weapons. I, I mean, I understand in LAPD or some of these other locations, but as far as we are here, um, and in fact, local agencies have even adopted policies about not participating in some of it. But in some of it too, um, because some people have used it more broadly, I think that we have to be careful. I mean, Homeland Security funding, for example, can be used for a lot of things that I think people would think are a good thing, like body cameras and, and tasers and less lethal weapons, for example. So we also want to be careful about how broadly we define some of these things.
But but I think as far as uh, we are here, Jeff, I mean, I think that the sheriff's office is moving, the, the sheriff himself is moving forward with, um, you know, with bringing forward the, the first reporting. I think it's reasonable to have an annual reporting requirement on this type of equipment. I think that people will find that we actually don't have a lot of this kind of equipment in use here. Um, and so I, I think it'll be fine. I don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Uh, yes, thank you. If I could have a follow up. Sure, please. Uh, I understand that the AR 15s are exempt uh, in the state bill. Uh, is it your understanding, and am I correct in thinking that the Board of Super, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Board of Super, County Board of Supervisors could at their desire, eliminate those as a possible weapon, mainly because of the uh, extensive damage caused by the that uh, the uh, uh, the ammunition in that in that weapon. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't I don't know if we have the ability to specifically eliminate it, but I'll, I'll say that um, you know I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be in favor of the elimination of that as an option for for local law enforcement I mean and let me also say this Jeff I mean I, I don't know um, I, I mean you may have a background in um, in public safety or in the military but but at the end of the day um, if you've if you've followed which I'm sure you have some of the recent uh, incidents of shooting even here in our own community it's not like um, it's not like some of the local gangs are, are sitting around and, and just buying Saturday night specials. I mean, these are guys with, with ARs themselves. And ultimately, I think that we need to think about um, it's important for law enforcement to also come home at night. And, and one of the advantages to an AR over a shotgun, as you know, is that that's more of a, of, a, of a broad pellet shot as opposed to a much more directed shot that you can do with an AR. So I mean, whether or not I have the capacity, so your question was whether whether we can, and the answer is I don't know, but if it were to come to me and if I were asked as to whether I would support the elimination of the AR for local law enforcement, I, I would say no. Now, if the question is broader about whether or not uh, we add ARs into the reporting requirement on the annual use of, I mean, they're already included in the use of force report, uh, then I think that that's, that's a reasonable discussion to have. We're already having a very transparent discussion about militaristic weapons Per this bill anyway that'll be coming forward and so if the discussion is to add an AR on when it's already uh, being included as far, part of a use of force it doesn't seem like a large additional data responsibility for the agency and so I think that's a reasonable discussion to have. Thank you I appreciate your response. Mm -hmm. Okay I don't see any other hands up. Hands up. So um, Emily Emily, we'll, we'll should we go ahead, ahead and, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, Dale, Dale, I see. Okay, hi, Dale, what's your question for Zach? Yeah. Can, you hear me? can you hear me back? A little can bit, Dale. Me, yeah. yeah, I can hear you. It's not perfect, but go not for great. it. If you can't, if we can't understand uh, you. What was the increase? What was the increase in the TOT? And they didn't include a new group, did it? Like uh, long-term rentals, it was just less than thirty days. No, but I, I should have actually defined that. I think that was a reason. That was a reasonable question to ask. So, by definition, a transient occupancy tax can only be used uh, or only be um, charged for. Uh, 29 and less days and 30 and more days under state law or is deemed a long-term rental. So it doesn't add in new categories per se. What it does is just change the existing people that are being charged. So for a hotel, a motel, or an inn, it goes from 11% to 12%, which is what our neighboring jurisdictions already charge. For vacation rental properties, it goes from 11 to 14%. And those are the short-term rentals that are within uh, your neighborhood, our neighborhood. Okay. okay. The, 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 this question that Matt is. Uh, I have a quick question. Just one yeah. more. If you can hear me, try. Dale, so, we uh, can't. Why don't you, why don't you, that might be more specific. <laughs> I know it's hard. 
We're just not Whoa. able to understand you. You might have to type your question in, Dale. Can you, you type wanna. it into the chat? And Kate, we can take your question. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I posted in the chat, um, sure. what is the sustainability update? And I think this is pretty important because this is like looking at the county's general plan from 1994 and modifying things and making changes and code updates and stuff like that. And it's it's a pretty, pretty intriguing and and uh, comprehensive draft right now, and they're starting to do public workshops. And I think this is really something that everybody in Seacliff would be would really want to follow, right? Right, Supervisor Friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, yes, and uh, look, we've already been down this road before about five or six years ago, as you probably remember, and then. Uh, it took a back seat for a few reasons, cannabis being one of them and a couple other things, but it's a pretty broad update, Kate. I mean, to your point, this thing seems sort of esoteric um, when you think about the general plan and what's allowed and what's not allowed, but we really haven't modernized our code to even allow, for example, like farm stands, which exist in agricultural areas right now, outside of people's properties aren't even allowed legally, even though people are doing it. Um, where and when, small scale weddings can take place. I mean, like the Sand Rock Farm and had issues or other bed and breakfast that may have 10 a year, for example, but they're not actually permitted to do so. Or maybe a winery wants to simply have a jazz band on a Saturday and we don't allow any sort of amplified music there even a certain number of days a year. These are all actually part of what would be considered as part of this. I mean, it's broader than that, but it gives you a sense of, of on the ground uh, what it actually would mean. Um, I really, really, really want to believe that it'll be completed before I die. But Kate, it's already been five, six, seven years. And we still got to do the EIR. I'm not totally sold on it, but I'm, I'm glad we're reinvigorating the, uh, the public workshops with it because I think all the people that participated at that time, um, you know, it's time to reinvigorate it. I'm interested in the county parks section, which is updating zoning. And then just chapter seven looks like this. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Dale, I saw you were able to ask your question in the chat. Thank you. 100% of the money stays locally. Yes, none of this goes to the state. Thanks for asking that. Of those two tax measures. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Uh, you trying to... Zach, did you have anything else? No, do you want me... I can introduce Matt, though, if you want. Please. Um, so... Uh, Matt, as you know, is a Seacliff resident, and he's still here, which I think is a really good sign for all of us. Yeah. Uh, but Matt is the Deputy County Administrative Officer, which means that he's uh, very, very, very high-ranking in the county. And, and because we think he's just uh, an amazing guy, we, we gave him a, a, a very difficult task, which is that we're, we've integrated, and he'll be speaking about it tonight, the Public Works and Planning Departments, which are two departments that actually work, I think, a lot more closely together than people recognize, both on environmental issues and transportation issues. But if you've ever had a permit that's been uh, stuck in a process, I mean, a lot of it does have to do with the exchange of information and responsibilities of these two agencies. So bringing them together into one and under Matt's leadership. I think is going to be uh, very positive moving forward. I mean, it, I'll say this, it, it, it's a heck of a lot more responsibility that doesn't come with an increase in pay, but he's been just taking it on uh, with the kind of heart that he has. So Matt, thanks for doing that and, and looking forward to hearing you talk about this integration tonight. Great, thank you, Zach, and good evening, everybody. And so Zach, I appreciate that nice uh, introduction. And so I'll start with that topic. I do have a few other topics that I'd like to share tonight uh, with regard to some projects in our area here. Uh, but to begin with the integration of planning and public works, I'm going to start with a little background, actually. Um, the two departments are currently on the fourth floor downtown at 701 Ocean Street, and they've been there together for more than 50 years. And that co-location has been really beneficial. It's, it's you know, helped with communication and, and uh, project coordination. But uh, 50 years ago was a different time. Today, you know, expectations are much higher with speed of communication and collaboration. And to be honest, there's a lot more coordination with legislative issues. We have a lot of new legislation that comes from the state that requires us to work very, very closely. And so it makes a lot of sense to, to bring them even closer together with a common culture, common management, 
uh, which actually, you know, is going to lead to daily communication, weekly communication. Uh, and it's, it's also going to be an opportunity to do some process improvement, which goes to, you know, one of the points that Zach was making about uh, permitting. And so land use permitting uh, goes through the planning department, but it includes the building department and public works. And those are the major players when your permits are submitted and, and then reviewed. And so one of the key features of this new integrated apartment is that we are designing a new combined front counter. And that front counter will be called the Unified Permit Center. And it's an opportunity where uh, all the different staff, you know, from say drainage or sanitation or transportation and the building side and the zoning side will all be sitting together. They will be sitting near each other. And we think that will help communication a lot. Uh, there'll be opportunities for cross-training. There will be uh, quicker responses to our customers. And so our focus in this new unified permit center will be customer focus. You know, it's about the customer experience. It'll be, you know, one counter that people can come to and get all the answers that, they, that they're looking for with regard to whatever type of project they're doing, whether it's, you know, a large discretionary project or it's a, you know, it's a backyard deck replacement you can get all the answers in one spot. And I think that's gonna really benefit people. Um, it does, it will take a bit of time. We have started this integration process. We, we've been meeting regularly. We've been making some improvements already, but this front counter will take a bit more time. We actually started an interim phase of the new front counter. We actually have public works staff sitting at the front counter right now. When those uh, office hours are open, uh, we have staff there. and. And there's a lot of cross training just happening naturally. But as we go forward with the design and hopefully into construction, we can uh, present a new model for the public. And uh, I believe that it will result in greater communication, collaboration, which means a better customer service, better customer experience. And, uh, and we're pretty darn excited. So it's, uh, there's more to it than that, but I know we have limited time tonight. And I do wanna share a little bit about about some projects, uh, so I'll dig into that. And I think uh, um, Emily had shared a few areas that, that you would like some updates on. So I'll start with that, and then I'll even share a few of my own updates that I think are important to, uh, to our area. So I'll start with, uh, well, I'll start with a couple of real small ones. I, there was a question about some storm damage, and I think it's at 164 Sea Cliff, and I believe it's done. I was going to drive by it tonight on the way home, but I was rushing to get here so I could be on the call. But I'm almost certain it's right there on the bluff near the walkway. And that, that project has been repaired. It was just a very small slip out, but there's been some paving done. And I believe that one's uh, resolved. That's at 164 Seacliff. And then, the, you know, the age old topic of the Seacliff Village uh, streetscape project, you know, it's there, it's designed, it's shelf ready. We are looking for grant money. We just haven't been successful yet. So uh, that's an active project. It just doesn't have money yet to build, but I would tell you it's on our radar. Uh, Steve Wiesner, it's near and dear to his heart and he's always looking for money and trying to find a way to deliver that project. So we, I appreciate your patience. Uh, we're working on it. Um, one that is funded and that's very, very exciting. Actually, I'm very excited about it. Being a resident here, I can't wait to, to use it and to visit it is our new Aptos library. And so I know it, it looks a little bit, um, it kind of looks discerning or concerning right now, the way it's just sitting there fenced off and, and uh, not, it's kind of idle. I know the fire department got a little bit of use out of it, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, we're planning a little demo by the end of, of this month. And so that's, um, that's very exciting. And we should be starting construction mid-April. And uh, that project's gonna go about a little more than a year. We should be wrapping up June of next year. And uh, if you don't know this already, it's uh, Bogard Construction will be doing the work. Uh, they're a very reputable company. Uh, they're local. The uh, construction contract is for a little more than 12 million. Uh, but I will add that uh, Friends of the Library and, and other, others have donated a lot of money to make it even better than 12, I think it's 12.3 million to make it even better than that. We've got, uh, we've received right about $900,000 of additional donations to make the library even better. And uh, one of the other elements that, that you won't see in the typical 
Bogart construction is that we were able to uh, uh, design it with solar panels on the roof. It'll be a net zero energy building. It's gonna have some amazing features in there that'll uh, go back to our environment with redwood cladding and things like that. It'll also include an area that uh, will display many of our historical uh, memorabilia that uh, John Hibbles gathered and displayed for, for a very long time. So uh, there'll be a spot for that. And it's just, there's so many great features beyond what you would normally see in a library. So we're very excited. Uh, again, we have to be patient, but demo uh, will start this month and construction start next month and we should be done uh, next summer. So very exciting. A couple of other projects I'd like to share about, um, got my notes here on these. We, uh, the rail and trail. And so um, no matter what side you're on, it's exciting to do something, right? I think everybody's been waiting for some kind of activity uh, to kick this one off. And so the county is the lead on segments 10 and 11. And what that is, is that's the, that's the segment from 17th Avenue all the way to, to uh, State Park. So it's a good long stretch. Um, I will share with you that, um, in April, actually on April 6th, we will have a virtual open house and we'll be sharing some schematic drawings, some initial preliminary designs, just trying to get the word out there. And then uh, the week of April 11th, uh, we're going to host an in-person open house to share the same information and answer questions and, and talk about the project. Uh, you probably know this already, but uh, the project is being designed to include both alternatives, both the interim trail and then the ultimate rail and trail. Uh, I will share with you that uh, if our region is unsuccessful with rail banking, then we will be pursuing the rail and trail option as being, being that that's the only viable option without rail banking. So, but that said, it's still very, very exciting that we were taking these uh, large steps forward. Uh, we're also working with the city of Santa Cruz to do segments eight and nine. And then again, with the RTC working with segments 12, uh, both segments eight, nine, 10 and 11 will have CEQA documents out this fall. And that'll be a public document and will result in a uh, CEQA certification, which gives us really shelf ready status to go pursue grant funds. Uh, we will be pursuing some grant funds this year and, uh, and here on until we get it funded and, and built. So we're very excited about that project. A couple of other projects that are coming down the, the pipe, pipeline uh, right here are Soquel Drive. Uh, we are going to improve about five and a half miles of Soquel Drive from La Fonda all the way out to State Park, upgrading all the signals, uh, making them um, adaptive, making them um, synchronized of sorts, making them bus priority. And also we plan to build uh, quite a few miles of buffered bike lanes. Uh, we'll be closing sidewalk gaps that are out there today. It'll be a safer, uh, more functional corridor uh, with traffic congestion reductions and uh, bicycle and pedestrian improvements throughout the whole corridor. So very excited about that. And along with that project, uh, Highway 1 improvements. And so this is a regional collaboration on uh, Highway 1, the first segment, uh, which would be Soquel Avenue to 41st, will, is going out to bid this spring, maybe into the summer. And we hope to start construction on, on Highway 1 this fall. And we are also, I didn't say this, but Soquel Drive, that improvement is planned to start this fall also. So bear with us on the construction. Um, we, we've heard it said, some people call it, it's going to be Carmageddon out there when we have all these projects going at the same time, but that's how the funding lined up. So that's how we're going to deliver these projects and it's for the good of all of us. And so I know that our community will be understanding. I'm saying that with a bit of a smirk because some people won't be understanding, but we hope they will. But Highway 1, that first segment actually includes a new pedestrian crossing at Chanticleer. And I tell you that because we're also gonna get another pedestrian crossing here uh, at Mar Vista. And so after we can get, after we get that first project out under construction, Soquel Avenue to 41st, including the Chanticleer pedestrian overcrossing, we also have funding to do the next segment, which will be Bay Porter to State Park. And that one will include the Mar Vista pedestrian overcrossing, which is very, very exciting, which leads me to 
uh, Mar Vista. So Mar Vista being a, a, a key route connecting the pedestrian overcrossing, it also crosses the rail trail segment uh, we will be looking at a plan line on Mar Vista, which means that we will be looking at preliminary conceptual designs of what should Mar Vista look like in the future. And we'll be looking at the south side primarily, connecting the overcrossing to the rail trail, but we will also be looking at the north side, trying to get it connected up to Soquel Drive safely for our, our students to get to school and uh, everybody else that would like to use that segment. And so we'll start with the plan line and then we will that will lead us into more design details which then we can pursue funding and hopefully wrap all these projects together where we have interconnectivity so that interconnectivity would be soquel drive highway one uh, and all the way down to the rail trail so we're really excited about the improved circulation in our region it's a it's been needed for many many decades uh, and we're finally seeing light at the end of that tunnel and I think, uh, and I'm probably out of time, so I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, offer a few minutes for any questions. Anybody? Yeah, so funding, it, it's, it's approved for segment 12 and the Soquel Drive project, La Fonda to State Park. And so those are all funded. Well, not segment 12. Uh, segment 12 is part of the, next. I didn't get to that, but there's a, Highway one improvements are really in three phases. So the first one, SoCal Avenue to 41st is funded. funded. With the crossing, that's funded. The second phase, which is Bay Porter to State Park, which includes the Mar Vista overcrossing, that one's funded. Uh, but then the third phase is not funded. And what that is, that's from State Park all the way to Freedom. And that includes segment 12. That one is not funded yet. We're pursuing funding, but not there okay. yet. Thanks. Okay. I'm taking notes. <laughs> we, have okay. a, <clears throat> we have a question from Johanna. Okay. You'll have to unmute. Hi. Uh, thanks for considering my comments. Um, I just saw a post on Nextdoor today saying that the new crossing gates are going up at uh, Parade Avenue. Is that something the county is handling? So uh, we did permit it, it's, uh, but it's being done by the, the Swinson Development Company. And uh, so they are pursuing that. I, I don't know the exact details, but I do know that uh, their vision is to have that crossing ready to open by the end of May, middle end of May. So that is correct. Okay, can I follow up on a question? Sure. Um, if the, back to the rail trail and the whole debate, if the rail banking is not feasible and they do have to put the trail next to the tracks through Aptos Village, don't all the crossing gates kind of interfere with where the placement of the trail is supposed to be? And if that's the case, what, what, what's the uh, process for that? Sure. So some of them will, well, all of them will get upgraded, you know, striping, signage, um, physical hardscape improvements. Um, and in fact, there are a couple along the corridor that they even get shifted to make room. Um, that's the kind of information that you will get to see in April when we um, share the preliminary design, uh, all those details, we will be showing that rail and trail and how it could look. It won't be final design, but it'll be preliminary and answer a lot of those questions. But yes, all that will have to be upgraded, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mary Dixon wrote in the chat that she'd like to know the date that the Seacliff Mar Vista pedestrian bridge will be built and how long it'll take to build. Sure. So, so the Mar Vista pedestrian overcrossing will go to construction in 23, start in 23. We don't have a date specific and it'll take about two years. So we should have a complete in 25. Blink of an eye. It seems that way. I got to tell you, I, and as Zach mentioned that I live here and, and, you, and I know quite a few of you and I've been here for four years, if you can believe that. And it was literally a blink of an eye. Absolutely. <laughs> I personally would like to see the art on that instead of being just redwood trees or ocean. I think on the redwood side of the freeway, there should be trees and then it transitioned to ocean, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> I, I don't you know what, oh, no, I hear you. Uh, that is pretty well final at this point. I know. And we got the, you know, we got the trees and a little bit of the mist, you know, the fog. But the other thing we got recently, and some of you may know this, but some of you may not, 
uh, we got our name on there also, Aptos. Aptos is going to be on the structure wow. itself, which is very, very exciting. Um, and and with that idea, we actually are going to put, um, well, Capitola is going to get uh, their name on the new Capitola road crossing. So we're getting some name recognition on Highway 1, which I think is really important uh, for us as a community. So very exciting. I know. I wonder how long it took to decide on the font for those. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's it's even to this day we're still kind of like you know we looked at the scoring and it was close and so yeah it's still a, it's still it's going to be a debate and I guarantee the one that wins out is still not going to be you know loved by all but right no I know I know I'm a font person so I I thought that was cute that they gave us a choice when we were yeah. voting thanks um when is that auxiliary lane project between Bay and Porter and Park slated yeah. to start so so yes yeah, so the the second phase of highway one is bay porter to state park and that includes the auxiliary lane and the bus and shoulder and the mar vista pedestrian crossing so that whole project will go as one project start construction in 23 okay. and hopefully be done in about 25 now you know i'm giving you big years here so we don't have it all uh contracted yet but that's our that's our anticipation yeah, I hope you can get contractors. I hope they're not too busy on other things. That's well, stop, big stop that, Emily. The, yeah, the, I know. <laughs> the good thing about big highway jobs is we'll attract people from all over the state, out, out of state. We'll attract, uh, you know, the big highway project builders. You know, I know the building industry is really right. hurting right now because lack of labor and all that, but that's more of a local issue. And uh, our larger transportation projects will attract them from far away, which is it is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I have one more question about the streetscape project in Seacliff. Because it's unfunded, uh, we did ask for that crosswalk to be put in at the corner of Broadway and Center. And it was great. It looks great. People are very happy about it. Um, are there any other sort of minor things that can be done to improve safety in that area? Because we've just not asked because we've been waiting for the project. And, right. you know, even just repainting the crosswalks and the center divide, things like that, mm -hmm. I think are so overdue that it would be great if, you know, next time the paint truck's out, and I realize this still costs money. But um, if we're gonna, if it's gonna be that long before we yeah. see anything, it would be really helpful, especially when summer comes. Yeah, no, those are that's really reasonable, and uh, I'll make sure that you know our crews for the striping they try to do. It's about half of the county every year, and sometimes they hit the mark, sometimes not quite, because that's a really really tall order. Um, but I will check on that and make sure it's on their radar. I know it is. Uh, because it's a pretty urban area and we try to keep that striping fresh but um, that's those are really reasonable requests you know fresh signage fresh striping keep it safe as we can in its current configuration absolutely the cat is leaving the room Sorry. okay and then is the april are the virtual open house and the in-person um they'll be sort of the same content do you do you happen to know where the virtual the in-person would be so the in-person, we haven't um, we haven't got the venue okay. dialed in. That's, and I just said the week of April 11th for the in-person. Okay. Uh, the uh, April 6th is set. It's a virtual. Uh, we actually have a website for it, and we're updating that website. should be updated next week, and it's, okay. it's really going to be nice. Um, I actually, I can, Rebecca, I can send you the link to it. If you go to our website right now, you can find the old version. And it's kind of blah and boring. Um, so I would suggest we wait till the new one comes out. It's it's pretty cool actually. Okay. I'll send I'll send the link out next week. Thanks. And yeah, then we can let the members know. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely let them know. You want me to send that to you, Emily, or both of you? Well, well, both. Yeah. That way <laughs> we we fight <laughs> over, we fight out over who gets to send emails. <laughs> okay. Got it. It's, it's who's in town. I don't believe we have any more questions for Matt. Okay. So now Thank we'll. So Thanks, Matt. That was great. I like funded, unfunded. That makes it clear. So Rebecca has your turn, Rebecca, to talk about the um, mini park and okay. improvements we want to do. Okay. I. 
Let's see. I need to unmute. There we go. I'm, uh, let's see. Okay, let me share my screen here. And can you all see? Yes. Can you all see this? Okay. Yes. So what, um, so what we're looking at here is just a little bit of the path at the, this is one of the worst parts, just to see there's cracks in here and the, the sides have degraded. So uh, the, I can't even remember the last time we had them done. It was before I moved to Seacliff. So anybody who's lived here longer than me um, can tell. And um, this is a part here where the bender board is gone. It's been gone for, I don't know, over 10 years. And um, it's just really in need of being redone. So, um, oops. So I don't know if anybody has any questions before that. Uh, we did get some, uh, a couple of bids and uh, the landscape company who's been doing our most recent spruce ups uh, had a, a relatively affordable amount. I'm I'm thinking it's probably going to go up um, since we got that uh, bid, but that's why we're asking for four thousand dollars, which um, we would love to have. <laughs> so, what we wanted to do was have everybody vote. Does anybody have any questions? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, then what we're going to do is if you look in your uh, Zoom app under reactions, uh, there's a couple choices. Um, what I really wanted to do is ask if there were any no votes, not to put anyone on the spot. But does anybody object to it? It's very quiet. And you can go to reactions and maybe there's a little... A, a red circle with an X. Yeah, that's a no vote. That, and that would I didn't no even want to have to do that because then I'll have to count them all. But, um, but I, you know, it's, um, I'll just go ahead and yes, okay. Mary's put her little check mark in there. You can vote yes if you like. I've got thumbs up, I've got check marks. We just wanted to make yeah. sure because this is something our members have to vote on. Ooh, even Matt, okay. Great, That's thanks, lovely. Matt. Diane. I really appreciate that. Um, well, we'll go ahead and plan for that then and uh, stay tuned. Yeah, we have a majority. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, has anybody considered coating the uh, compacted DG with elastomeric acrylic to make it last longer? No. no. Um, we haven't. We would probably have to get permission from state parks to do that because I believe the path parts are on state park property. I suspect that they probably wouldn't, but it's not something we really had considered. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no, that's why we need wait, yeah. that's why we need more people on the board that have these creative experiences in, in this kind of stuff because you know yeah. I'm a golfer. So yeah. and Jeff, Jeff it wasn't it but, wasn't part of the they, we were not asked that by the uh, by the landscape company and the other company that helped. So um, yeah. Yeah. FYI, uh, I did my back walk, my walk to the back of my place in my patio in DG and coated it with Elastomeric acrylic and it's lasted for more than eight years uh, with no problems at all. Uh, and I've used Elastomeric acrylic in the past on roofing projects. So mm -hmm. it might be something to consider. However, if it's not permitted by the state. You know, I don't like know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to find out. I, I know Matt's in the room, but I don't want to put him on the spot for that kind of coding. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's a pretty much a, a something that we just had never done because the paths were done, you know, in the previous century. I, I don't have any experience with it, but I mean, if it's, it's worth looking into, I would say, but I, I would imagine it's not cheap. Okay, no. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well then, okay, so, so I'm going to close. I'm just going to talk about some of the upcoming projects and things that we're going to do. Um, in addition to our quarterly membership meetings, um, in the newsletter we did talk about, we are going to do a Seacliff neighborhood yard sale on April 30th. Um, the details are in the newsletter. So this is a chance for all of us at the same time to <laughs> fill up our driveways or front yards with things that we want to, um, to get rid of. And um, Janet is going to, wow, well, what's her name? Janet um, Perry is going to help coordinate that. But really, we're going to put up signs for you and you just have to be out there from nine to one um, if you want to participate. And if you do want to participate, it would be good to email Janet Perry at her email address. And again, that's in the um, newsletter. It's Janet Perry, P E R R Y, at gmail.com. So we hope hope that's a big success and then we could do it once or maybe twice a year we'll see you know we're going to give it give it a, a try and then next is the beautification that's going to be coming up the beautification award so you can start doing your uh yard work now um and then finally the you know be looking for the next newsletter with our second quarter ice cream social and it'll be a meet and greet. We usually try to bring a new county, uh, you know, a, some sort of county person that you haven't met yet. So that will be in some Saturday in June. And then finally, the state of SIA, like I said, at our fourth quarter meeting, we're all fiscally sound, we're doing well. And we do have in the, we do have $4,000, thank you very much to, to work on the pads. So are there any other questions um, before we adjourn? Does anyone have any? Again, I want you to, I want people to join the board. Please um, find some resident or seek, and you have to be, um, you have to be a member of the association for at least a year. And we do like it if you live in your home. I don't know if that's a requirement, but because um, we have people that are members, but it's their, they rent their house. So anyway. We are looking for tech savvy and idea savvy people. So, and the treasurer would like to be replaced. Oh, right. And treasurer, yeah, Rebecca's, you know, she's on her third year of treasurer. And I think she's done it before, but, you know, could, but um, she took a few years to be president. So, so yes. Well, we and one that. thing that's changed is uh, for those of you that, may or may not remember, Steve Gibbs was our membership person. And that position was actually created uh, out of the treasurer's job because the treasurer at the time didn't want to do it. So Steve said, I'll do it. And that was back when we had, you know, 250 members. And now we have about 360. And so that's a good problem to have, but it just... Uh, Steve moved away. So Emily yeah. and I are sharing some of those membership jobs. We're also sort of evaluating, you know, what that position is going to look like. And it may be absorbed into other uh, board uh, activities. So we're just, uh, we're still trying to figure that out. So I'm not at a rush to drop the money ball bag. But um if somebody who has some uh, experience with Excel and finance, that would be great. Well, if that's it, um, thank you everyone for attending and hope to see you at the ice cream social in a few months, but be safe in the meantime and have a good St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> all right, thanks Rebecca. See you all. Again, thank thanks, you. Matt and Zach. Thank, thank you, you for you the so meeting. Much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good info. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for all coming. Right.